my family was not about vacationing. Like, we never, ever went on vacation. Is my mom in the room? Because I just have to sometimes check before I tell these childhood stories. <laughs> Hi, mom. Don't censor your story just because your mom's in the room. What's up, mama? <laughs> you have been my favorite mom since the day I was born. I'm serious. So, now that I know you're in the room, we never went on vacation, ever. And one summer, my dad gets a wild hair. I'm serious. Like, out of nowhere, he just decides that we're going to go on vacation, but not any sort of vacation. He goes all out Griswold. Okay, I mean, he goes all out. He buys a new conversion van. We are in the 80s, people. Okay, we are in the 80s. All right, okay, hold on. There are definitely kids in this room who have absolutely no idea what in the world it is, is a, a conversion So van. nowadays, if you see a conversion Tell them van, how sweet that is. it looks creepy. Very, very Stay away creepy. from all conversion Stay away from children. all conversion Christ. vans. They are creepy. But in the day, it was cool. And I don't know if you can say this in church, but our van was pimping. I don't know if you can say that. I'm not saying it. I'm just saying I don't know if I can say it. That's all I'm saying. But we were rolling. I mean, we had, in the day, we had a cell phone in the van. Wait a second. It wasn't a cell phone, right? Because it was connected. It is cellular. It had, okay, it, it was cellular. cellular. But it didn't have the little Whatever twirly the heck cord. That it had a twirly cord right. that was connected to the, inside the lid of the console. We had a cell phone in the van. Some of you are like, younger ones are like, I carry, I carry. How old I are carry you, that Dad? in my pocket. Yo, all right. So we had a we had a phone and that. Wait for it. Wait, wait. Guess what else we had in this van? A TV. <laughs> we had a TV. Hardly anybody had this. Yeah, we were like the only people on the planet that had a TV in the van. It was. Um, I thought we did. It was amazing. But he is. So, my dad is so, like, just irrational, radical. Uh, it, unreasonable. He bought a van. And he said, "Hey, I know we never go vacationing, so let's just let's just take a trip for a month, <laughs> and let's just travel the whole western hemisphere of America, and let's just stick ourselves, the whole family, in a van, confining ourselves to a mobile unit, okay, for a month." Now, I'm just going to tell you, this is, this is a sore subject, all right? Uh, a year later, my parents were divorced. I'm just saying a year later. It don't, here's why. Listen, this is the reality, people. First of all, don't buy a van. At least not a conversion van, Not a conversion van, because right? they're creepy. Secondly, don't stick your family in it and travel for a year almost, it feels like, because here's what happened. Here's what happened. Never vacation. Get the wild hair, buy the van. Stick us in the van, and let's head out. So my dad, he was smart in this. My dad's a smart guy. He's probably watching. Hey, Dad, love you. It was irrational. It was irrational. We head off in the afternoon. I'm thinking this is smart because he wants us to what? Sleep that evening. So he drives all night. And I wake up to the Rocky Mountains. It was postcard perfect. It was beautiful, all right? But day two, day two, going through the Rocky Mountains. My mom, I'm convinced she was using Prozac or Xanax or something that may or may not have been prescribed or may she, maybe she borrowed from a friend that the doctor had prescribed to her. But she needed drugs to handle this. How old were you? Did you tell them how old you I were? Th- Ten, I think. Okay, they need to know that. Yeah, Very Ten, important 10 or 11. Because I, I, can, I can have my moments. I was... You put me in a van, okay? I am stir crazy. I've played Uno for the thousandth time. There's only so much you can look at out the window, and I'm going nuts, and I'm bouncing off the walls inside this van. And she, I think she was high on some sort of medication, and she turns around. She is shaking and sweating, maybe saliva. She turns around, and, and if you've seen the movie, don't ever watch The Exorcist, don't watch it. It's demonic. It's evil. Don't watch it. But I watched it. And, and, and this is what she did. Her head spun around real slow. And she's going. <laughs> she was shaking like a rabbit squirrel. And she. And you know what she said to me? She said. I just want to hurt you. <laughs> and I said. Dad. I mean, she was out of control, clearly. Out of control. Day two. Oh. Out of 30 days. Of 30 days. Stupid! 
You don't do it. So that's my, that's my childhood memory of vacationing. Wow. And you know what? We all have those memories. But I want you to think about this. What is the point of a vacation? The point of a vacation is like all winter long, we plan and we prepare, unless you're like the last minute people, you know what I mean? And like kudos to you because I can't do that. But you plan and you prepare and in your mind you have this beautiful scene of like the beach or the ball game, whatever it is you do. Like my family, every summer, St. Louis Cardinals. Like every summer, scorching hot. You're going to be out there. You're going you're gonna to burn. You're going to scorch. I was the only girl cousin in the family. And we took like, ma- we had a conversion van too. Okay. Creepy. We would pack in there and all the boy cousins and they were horrible, horrible to me. All right. I'm the only girl. One of them's on the front One row. One of the cousins is here today. And I remember, you know, it's, it's all about making the memories. Okay. Didn't they put you in a Johnny on the street? Yes. So one time we're at a Kmart. Remember Ooh. those things before they went out? Right. We're at a Kmart. We special. come out. Blue light. That blue light. Sunlight. So we come out and, and the ball game's that afternoon, but we're just doing a little shopping, right? We're enjoying ourselves. I'm minding my own business. When I get like captured by three of my, my, my brothers and my cousin, they flip me upside down and like drag me over to a porta potty and they were trying to put me in upside down in a nasty porta john. Now listen, listen. These are my memories, okay? We That is why she is so scarred. We We have problems, all right? We have problems. Memories are supposed to be made. Porta potty PSTD. Now they didn't get it. They didn't get PTSD. it done. Okay, because I can go like rabid psycho yes. freak too. Okay, uh-huh. and they didn't get it done. I've seen. But it. here's what I want you to know: when you think about vacation, you think about rest, like rejuvenation, relaxation, making these beautiful memories. Like you have dreams of your children actually behaving when they never do at home, but you think like miraculously put them in the van. It's going to be a Amazing, yes, right? Yes. And then you come home and you swear you're never going again. You ever. swear we are never, ever going to do that again. We are not spending that kind of money to be miserable and want to kill our children. That, guys, it's what vacation's all about. If you haven't had yours yet, look forward to it. You know what I'm saying? But here's what also happens in this same season. Because we are so blessed with these awesome little computers in our hands, it's really easy at this season, right, the summer season, that you just, you know, you click on Facebook, and you start scrolling, and you start noticing, well, huh, huh, well, like school just got out, and they're already in Hawaii, you know what I'm saying, and I'm right here, like, working my tail off, that's what I'm doing, you know, on Memorial Day, Brad and I, I'm going to be really transparent, okay, we are not the throw the pool party, grill it all out, Memorial Day kind of people, but Memorial Day to Mainly us is because not we don't have a pool. And a grill. Or a grill. <laughs> Okay, so that's why we haven't invited you to the pool party. That's right. We don't have a grill, and we don't have a pool. So we told ourselves, you know what? Here's what we're going to do on Memorial Day, okay? And we were excited about our plan right there. We had our dock rebuilt last summer, but it didn't have wood put on it, all right? So all the metal 80-foot walkway down to this beautiful dock on the lake, but it didn't have any wood. So our kids have been now going down fishing and, and, and canoeing and all kinds of crazy stuff down there, but there's no wood. So it seems little bit dangerous, okay? Because it's eight well, we foot had, walkway, we had limited, about 30 foot off the ground, We had limited, 15, I don't limited know. access to the water because we had a limited budget when the dock was built, and so we were only able to afford to put the metal on and not the wood. That's right. Okay. So we finally get limited the wood. Limited access. We get the wood. It's stacked underneath the tarps for like a month because we were stoked. We got a killer deal. Bought all the wood. So Memorial Day, I'm like, hey, babe, you work on the truck. Me and the girls... We got this, okay? I've never cut wood for a dock before, but I don't care. I can do it, all right? I called my dad, who sees like the contractor dude. I'm like, Dad, just tell me how long these boards need to be. I'm cutting all the wood today. He was like, okay. So he told me. Me and the girls, we're out there sweating, getting our tan on because we love the heat, okay? We're out there in full sun. Forget the shade. We want the tan. So we're out there. We're cutting all day long. We cut all the boards, okay? Like three-fourths of them. All the ones for the 80-foot walkway. But then it's, it's too late to keep going. I can't go down and, like, put them on. But I had them ready to roll, okay? So we go in the house. We get our showers. We get some takeout. We are feeling good about what we accomplished, accomplished. because we had planned this. Okay, even our daughters were excited because we were envisioning the beautiful opportunities in the summer to go down and not get knocked off the dock because there wasn't wood, not like scratch your legs on the meadow, but now we would have wood. So we're having these beautiful visions. And then we all sit down on the couches, right? Turn on a little Netflix, fixer upper comes on. Here we go. And we all grab our phones because that's just what we do, right? Don't judge. You do the same thing. So we all grab our phones. 
click on Facebook or Instagram or they're on Snapcrap, whatever they're doing, right? And I'm, and I'm like scanning, and I'm like, no way. Like everybody we know yep. threw a pool party and didn't invite us. Like mm-hmm. what the heck? Like we got a church with, with all these people. Nobody invited us over. Don't invite me. I'm just kidding, okay? And then I'm like, they had a pool party. Like we worked like dogs and we're burnt to a crisp today. And all of a sudden my plan, I was so excited about my plan. I was satisfied with what I got done. Now I had this nasty little feeling in the pit of my stomach that you kind of want to refer to as just kind of comparison. Kind of that moment when you kind of look at other people and you kind of think, well, man, they had a better holiday than I did. They, 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 had, they had nicer things than I did. Boy, they, they went to Hawaii, and don't I remember they went to Hawaii two years ago? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> they went again. Yeah. You know, weren't they at Disneyland last year? How'd they do that twice in a row? You know <laughs> what I'm amazing. saying? Like, it's all wow. I can do to shove my family in the car. Well, Branson, you know what I mean? And so all of a sudden, you saw that, and that's, that's home right there. We're touching home. All of a sudden, you start doing this thing called the curse of comparison. And you know what it leaves you and where it leaves me? Miserable. You know why? Because when you begin to compare yourself to other people, you will always find people who have something nicer than you. Always. You may be excited about the nice new truck you got that was nice and used. And, and you're excited, man. It's exactly what you wanted. And then you pull into the parking lot and you notice that it, everybody else is driving something nicer than what you are. You know, you go, you, you go in and you, you go to the school parties, right? And you're excited to bring in the cupcakes you bought at Walmart. You know what I'm saying? And you go in and you're like, school, like I showed up. I took my lunch break and I rushed over here. And then there's Sissy Homemaker with the gluten-free, you know what I'm saying? She coming in, she been working on them all day long. And here I am feeling like a loser now. Like I went to the Walmart bakery and got the ones that were on sale and ripped that sticker off. And here I brought them in. And you come in with the gluten-free you've been working on all night long. You know what? Loser mom right here. I take it. We start comparing and judging. And you know what it does? All of a sudden, this jealousy and this envy, this nasty feeling in the pit of our stomach begins to rise. And it's the curse of comparison. And we become discontent with our life and with where God has us when we start to look at what everybody else has. You know, it's simply human nature. If you have kids... You know, you've heard the old thing where kids say, my dad's stronger than your dad. Who taught them that? Nobody. It's human nature. First service, ask some people from first service what I made Brad do. I can't do it again. He refuses to allow no, me we had a talk in to the do office. this, okay? So don't you you missed ever. it. You missed it. <laughs> it's human nature. I want you to think about... All the different stories in the Bible that you know or maybe you don't. I'm going I'm to show you how crazy it is that even then we see all of these stories of discontent. You look at Saul and David. David, Saul was the first king of Israel. Saul had been anointed by God, but because of his own disobedience, God had ripped the kingdom away from him. He was physically still on the throne, but God had lifted his favor. And instead, God had anointed this little 15-year-old shepherd boy musician. And he said, you know what, David, you're my man now. You're the man I'm going to bring in. You're the man that I'm going to set on that throne, and you're going to rule for like 40-some years because Saul has been disobedient. And so David comes in to Saul's court, and he begins to serve him. And you can go to 1 Samuel 18, and you can read this story. But he begins to serve him. And as he does, man, Saul falls in love with this guy. Like, he loves him like a son. And believe it or not, he ends up giving one of his daughters to marry him. Two of them, actually. That's a, that's a whole other weird story. But... He used him too. He loved him. And then all of a sudden, we see this story in 1 Samuel 18. David has now killed Goliath. That's who I'm talking about. If you've ever heard that story, David and Goliath. David has gone out. He's killed Goliath. He's now coming in. He's now serving the king. And all of a sudden, they come in, and there's all these women. And I want you to just imagine in your mind, it's like this concert, okay? It's a concert with the biggest, hottest pop rock artist in in the nation at that time okay so imagine i'm going to date myself but imagine you are you're going to a michael jackson concert you remember what it's like standing in line for endless hours now i never went okay but i didn't go i I never saw him but he was the superstar of the day that's what david was all the women were freaking at david david and they just wanted to like reach out and touch him and like sweat just flew off of his hair onto them they're like oh david and they began to sing this stupid song. And they began to say, 
David, Saul, let me back up. Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. And all of a sudden, Saul, who loved David, now has this flip. He like psychotically flips the switch. And all of a sudden, there's this nastiness in the pit of his stomach, and he begins to feel jealousy begin to rise up, and envy begin to rise up. And you know what he does? He sets out on a mission to murder David. From that day forward, he was going after him, and you can read all of it in 1 Samuel, but you begin to see he goes off on this murderous spree. You can go back before then, and you can see Cain and Abel, the first two brothers. Comparison causes one of them to lose their life. Look at Joseph and his brothers. Comparison caused Joseph to have to be sold into slavery. You go all through the Bible, go into the New Testament, you see even the disciples, the ones who walked with God, the ones who were with Jesus, said, hey, Jesus, when we come into your kingdom, into the new kingdom, and you're on the throne, who's going to sit on the right? Who's going to sit on the left? Because there's 12 of us. You know what I'm saying? Who's, who's going to be... And then you see this story of Peter and Jesus. And then they're having this conversation. And Jesus looks at him and says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And he says, oh, you know that I love you. Read this in John 21. You know that I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. Don't miss this. Three times. Jesus says it again. Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Third time, Peter's getting annoyed. You know what I'm saying? It's like the mom who won't shut up goes over and over and over. You know what I mean? Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, then feed my sheep. And as soon as he does that, listen, here's what, here's what Peter does. You're Peter, okay? He, he looks around and he says, well, what about, what about John? What about him? The disciple you love, because he wrote that in third person, right? He says, what about him? And he says, why are you asking about him? What does this have? Does any of this have anything to do with him? I'm talking to you, Peter. Follow me and feed my sheep. You see, in that moment, what God was doing is giving Peter his future calling. He was laying it out three times very clear. I have called you to preach my word. I have called you to feed my sheep. Peter went on to preach on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 got saved in one stinking service. 3,000. He was laying out Peter's calling. And while Jesus is doing that, Peter's like, but what, 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 what about him? What, what, what's he supposed to do? Because you told me what to do. Well, what's he supposed to do? Comparison has been a part of human nature from day one. But here's where it leaves you. That curse of comparison will leave you miserable. You know why? Because it will never be good enough. You will have an attitude of complete dissatisfaction because you can always look around and see somebody who's got more, who's somebody who looks better, who's somebody's driving something nicer. They've got the nicer house, the nicer car, all these material things, even our calling. You can look at somebody else and say, I wonder why God called them to do that and called me to do this. You know what I'm saying? I, wanna, I, want, I want to have that voice. I want to have that personality. I tell Grant all the time, I'm like, people love you, dude. Like, he's our connections pastor. I'm like, you are the people's people. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's amazing. I'm like, I don't even like people. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I'm just kidding. We no, all no, she really <laughs> doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> kidding. I'm just an introvert. Like, he makes it look easy. She's like, honey, the phone's ringing. No, that's true. Answer it. I'm like, it's like, my mom. Right. Brad, take it. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm an introvert. We all have our calling and our gifting, and yet we start comparing it one to another. And when we do that, we become miserable and discontent. There's this, this, this pastor uh, who, in, in November of 2017, you would not have even known who he was. You still may not know who he is, but most people know who he is because in December of 2017, a popular social media uh, account shared a 10-minute clip all right, on Twitter of a, a, just a chunk 10-minute clip of one of his sermons, and it went bananas. It went crazy, and within 48 hours, over 2 million people had seen this message. Nobody knew who he was, and then all of a sudden, overnight, he becomes this mega, mega success in the ministry world, and people start calling him to have him come and preach at their churches, and he's on TV, and millions and millions and millions of people are being exposed to the hope the message that this guy is sharing. His name is Pastor Michael Todd. Does anybody know who Michael Todd is? 
Michael Todd was at C3 conference last February, and I had the privilege of of meeting him. And and I want to I want to just help you understand. Even in ministry, we're inundated, we're surrounded with opportunities to compare ourselves to other people. He is. Let me tell you why God has blessed him. Because Michael is a genuine man of God. He loves God with all of his heart. He is humble. He is sold out to God. And he just wants to get the message out there. And because God knows that he can trust him, God has elevated him. God has promoted him. God is using him like crazy. Now, I can have a pity party. And I can say, well, why didn't God have somebody put one of my videos on Twitter? So that two million people could watch it in 48 hours. And then, I mean, I haven't gotten any calls from Stephen Furtick, you know, to come and preach at Elevation Church. I haven't gotten any calls from Pastor Ed Young to come preach at his church. I haven't gotten any calls. The phone's not ringing. The phone's not ringing. But thanks, God, you put me out here in the middle of nowhere. There's buffalo across the road. I didn't even know they still existed. I'm just saying. I didn't even, I thought they went extinct. This Buffalo, Green Hills, we are in the middle of nowhere. And you had a star in a mobile home with like one family and no money. Thanks, God. Gotcha. <laughs> Phone's still not ringing. I could compare myself. But here's what we have to understand. Scripture says in Acts 20 and 24, I don't care about my own life. Remember, we've talked about this a lot in this church. We are servants of the Most High God. I want you to hear what I'm telling you. I'm going to speak to your spirit right now. Listen to what I'm saying. We are servants that belong to God. Our life doesn't exist. It doesn't matter unless we connect it to our Creator. Becoming who he wants us to be. Doing what he wants us to do. I don't care about my own life. The most important thing, listen, is that I complete my mission. The work that the Lord Jesus gave me to tell people the good news about God's grace. My mission isn't Michael's mission. My mission isn't Stephen Furtick's mission. My mission isn't T.D. Jake's mission. My mission isn't Ed Young's mission. My mission is my mission. The mission that God gave me. My purpose, your purpose, is to fulfill the plans and work through the process of becoming who God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do. We can't compare. Why would I compare myself to somebody else's calling? Why would I compare myself When God has given me a unique calling and a unique mission, I have to worry about what I'm supposed to do and worry about who I'm supposed to be. In Galatians 6, uh, 4 through 5, it says, Don't compare yourself with others. Just look at your own work to see if you have done anything to be proud of. You must each accept the responsibilities that are yours. Now, some of you would say, okay, I got it, Pastor. I need to put on blinders, and I need to focus, and I need to not pay attention to the brand new truck that my neighbor just bought on one side. And I need not pay attention to the brand new house that my neighbor is building on the other side. I need to put on blinders, and I need to just forget about it and just kind of just block it out. That's how I'm going to cope with this. No! That's not how you're going to cope with it, because God wants you to deal with it. Here's what he wants you to deal with. He wants you to sincerely celebrate with others. You have those friends that are one-uppers. You say, hey, man, I'm so excited. Just got a promotion. Oh, yeah, I got a promotion too. In fact, uh, I'm going to use that bonus that I just got, and we're going to go to Hawaii. We're going surfing a whole lot. We're going to get very tan and eat lobster, lots of lobster. I mean, I mean, you've got those friends that they like to one-up you. I'm telling you, we can't get caught in that curse of comparison. We can't put on blinders. We have to say, you know what? That's awesome. Praise God, man. God's blessing you. It's a matter of the heart. God wants to deal with our hearts. Here, if, you're, if you're struggling when, when you see things that people get or places they go or things they get to do, if that, if that feeling creeps up on the inside of you, God's not done dealing with you yet. And it's the same reason the children of Israel, they, they just cycled and cycled and cycled and cycled in the wilderness for years and years and years. And many of them died in the desert. Listen to me. They died in the desert. 
because they refused to reverse the curse of comparison. So you might say, well, what, how do I reverse the curse of comparison? What, what do I do? What am I supposed to do here? Here's what you're supposed to do. Be thankful. Be grateful. L- listen to me. Scripture says uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, you know, I, I say this scripture to myself all the time. Because, and this is a different message for a different day, but man, we like to complain. Right? We like to have our pity parties. We like to, when we compare ourselves, it leads to dissatisfaction. We become, we lose all sense of contentment. We lose all sense of being satisfied and being happy with the way things are. But God says, listen, but give thanks in all circumstances, in everything. Another version says in everything. Say in everything. Give thanks, for this is the will of God. Right now, where you are, with what you have, with what you've done, give thanks. Give thanks. God is asking you, when are are you going to be ready? When are you going to be able to pass the test? When are you going to be able to reverse the curse of comparison? When are you just going to be grateful? for what you have. Some of you, God hasn't moved you forward because you're cycling and he's not ready to promote you because you, you haven't got it yet. You, you're, you're still comparing yourself to other people. And what we do when, when we become dissatisfied and ungrateful, we say, God, you're not good enough. What I have, what I'm experiencing, what I'm living isn't good enough. And so, God, you're not good. That's exactly what we're telling him. God, you're not good enough. And he says, okay, Hang out in the desert just a little bit longer. Get a little, get a little more sunburn. All right? Starve a little bit. All right? He wants to rough you up because he loves you. He corrects. He disciplines those whom he loves. He wants to do something inside of you. But if you keep pushing back, if you keep pushing back, you can't grow through the process that he's trying to help you to grow through. Listen, Paul is so uh, on it when he, uh, when he shares this in his letter in Philippians. Listen to what he says. He says in Philippians 4 and verse 9, he says, Whatever you have learned, say learned, or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. Say practice. And the God of peace. Listen. Say peace. The God of peace will be with you. You want to know what peace is? It's when you get to a point to where everything is okay because you choose for it to be okay because of who God is and what he's done and where you're at. It, it is not circumstantial. It doesn't have to do with what you see. It has to do with who he is and who you are. Okay, so, so Paul is saying you're going to get to this place called happy. Not the world's definition of happy, but you are going to be content in every way if you will put into practice, if you will learn what I'm about to tell you. You skip down then to verse 10. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. At last you renewed your concern for me. They had been supporting him financially. Okay, this was his way. He was traveling all over the world preaching the gospel, and he relied very heavily on people uh, funding that vision as he traveled to be able to get the word out. He says, indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it, and now I, I'm, I'm not saying this because I'm in need right now. He was in prison. He was getting three squares a day. He wasn't in need, all right? But he said this, for I have learned, say learned, Second time he said it. For I have learned to be content. Say content. Whatever the circumstances, I have learned to be content no matter the circumstances. Verse 12, I know what it is to be in need. What he's saying is I know what it means to be broke. I know what it means to have nothing. And I know what it means to have plenty. I have learned. There it is. Third time. Say learned. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. He says it three times because it doesn't come naturally to you and I to be thankful, to be grateful, to be at peace, and to have contentment in every circumstance. It's something that we have to learn to do. 
We have to teach ourselves how to be content with the type of car we're driving, the type of salary that you're making, the type of house you live in, where God has you, where he's taking you. We have to learn, learn, learn. It's a process that God is taking us through. We've got to learn to be content in every season, in every situation. Being at peace, be thankful. That's how you reverse the curse. Constantly, whenever that spirit, and it is a spirit, it's a demonic spirit, that rises up in your heart and says, look what they have. Look what they're doing. Look where they're going. And you start to compare yourself. In that instance, here's, all I, here's what I want to put on you. You have a divine direction that God has given you. God has put you in a specific test. He's trying to put you through that process. He's working in. Stop comparing yourself and say, God, just start going down the list of what you're thankful for. D- do you have shelter? Did you have a bed to sleep in? Are, are you in the hospital right now dying of a disease? And even if you are, there's always, there will always be something to thank God for. Always, I don't care I don't care if, if life gets so horrible. I'm telling you, there, there will, until the last second you breathe in this life, there will always be something that you can thank God for. Are you grateful? Are you thankful? Go down the list and thank God. Say, God, thank you so much. And just begin to thank I'm telling you, you will feel it. You'll feel that heaviness come up out of you. That curse, of, that curse of comparison, you will feel it lift off you and you just begin thanking God. I'm telling you, it will leave you. We'll reverse the curse. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are uh, thankful, God, that you prick our hearts and you, you show us through your word who you want us to be. You, you deal with the dark, the dark parts of our heart, God, that we don't want to talk about. I pray today, God, by the power of your spirit that you would move upon us and you would help us to have an attitude of gratitude. In-
Make sure you pick up what we call our Next Step Kit as you exit on the left. They're on the table. And if you're online, just send us your address and they'll still be in the mail in the morning. This is a message from Brad and I on what you do next with a brand new Bible. We put your hands together for all of those that just raised their hand for salvation today. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.